people. Um, if we uh, need to unmute to have conversation or anything like that, uh, I went to Alex, who are both going to be leading our liturgy. And thank you to Kyung and Stacy, who are going to be leading us in song today as well. Uh, we will put the lyrics to the songs up on the screen when it is um, time to be singing. And we'll make sure, especially at that point that we're muted, because, uh, you know, when you try to sing on Zoom, everything kind of uh, it gets off a little bit. So we'll sound kind of ridiculous. Um, now, uh, if uh, if there comes a time to have some conversation or anything, we can also invite people to speak in the chat. Um, box. So if there are questions that come up during this time or you want to add in a thought that you're having, uh, please don't hesitate to use that chat function there. And you can chat with everyone or you can chat uh, privately with uh, individuals as well throughout this time. We will begin now that we hear our bells ringing at one past seven uh, to uh, with a song um, for our prelude. Mark Gustafson, and I'd like to play for you the Debussy Arabesque Number no. 1, composed in 1888.
All right. Thank you very much to Mark for that. Really appreciate it. You're getting rounds of applause. This is good. Welcome to worship on uh, this beautiful uh, final Wednesday in our midweek Lenten services. This year, we are focusing on what it means to be wandering in the wilderness. Uh, it's no secret that this year has been difficult uh, and that it has been a time of wilderness wandering for so many of us. Wilderness wandering is characterized by not knowing where we're going or what comes next, but living in trust and faith, we journey with God through the wilderness to what comes next. Let's pray together and then we'll sing together. Gracious God, we thank you for staying with us in the wilderness. We thank you for giving us your word, for giving us your commandments, for giving us your thoughts and ideas about the shape of the world. We ask God that as we wander through this time of wilderness uncertainty, that you would give form and substance to our lives. Help us to trust in you. In Jesus name we pray, amen. amen. And now let's sing together. Uh, I will put the words on the screen and uh, Kyung will be leading us. So the, it is great to have you. And one of the advantages is about I can worship with my kids at home. Yep. You know, sometimes they can sing, sometimes they just listen, but whatever they do, I'm just so happy for that. And also, um, I cannot hear your voice. I cannot hear your voice. So whatever you feel, whatever you sing, don't worry about too much and just sing, enjoy the word and his prayers about what you think. In Christ alone. I will sing the first verse two times. Thank you very much, Kyung. And now I invite Abigail Rauner to please lead us. Uh, you can unmute and then lead us in our uh, greeting and prayer for the wilderness. Welcome to worship. The season of Lent is a special time to focus on God's work in, with, and through us. This year we are focusing on the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. After more than 400 years of slavery, God's people were finally set free. Rather than entering immediately into the promised land, God's people were made to wander in the wilderness where they learned that God stays with them even when they face the unknown. We all go through wilderness times in our lives, times when we must face the unknown. In these moments, we learn to trust your ways so that we may live in peace. God of faithfulness, you give the law to shape the lives of your people. You showed the people in the wilderness that your desire 
is for healthy relationships. In the spirit, you led Jesus through in the wilderness to cross and the empty tomb. God of faithfulness led us this holy season of self examination and transformation, prayer and fasting, generosity and works of love, strengthened by the gift of your living word. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Abigail. All right. Our reading today comes from the book of Psalms. The first chapter, verses 1 through 3. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his way they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and the leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, what we have been doing every week is have uh, one of us, one of the three pastors, act as um, kind of the, the framer of um, our response to the scripture as we grapple with the, the question of wilderness. So I'm going to start off by asking um, Tim or Craig, either one, first, if you could um, help everybody um, maybe clarify for them, help them to understand what the psalmist means when he says the law of the Lord. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. What, what's the psalmist talking about? I'd like to hear Tim uh, speak to that. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Yeah, uh, so, uh, you know, there's there's a number of ways to think about what he, uh, the psalmist, is writing about when he says uh, that he meditates on the law of the Lord. So thinking just surface level, we can look at uh, the book of the Torah. That's the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in these books, there are 613 different laws including uh, the Ten Commandments, which are probably the ones that we are most familiar with. Um, and, uh, you know, I think when we first think about law, we just think about sort of the do's and don'ts, right? That is he just talking about meditating on what we should and shouldn't do. But what the law really is, is it's the shape that God gives to our life together, right? It is the way in which we... Uh, define our relationship with each other? What does it mean to live in good and right relationship with one another? And so I think when we hear the law, we might just think about those 613 or those 10 big yays and nays, yeses and nos. But I think it goes deeper than that. It's really about meditating on the ways of God in the world, right? Which covers some big overarching themes that do show up in the Torah, right? Themes of God's faithfulness, themes of uh, love and compassion, especially for those who have been downtrodden, uh, themes of listening to the stories uh, that shape who we are. I so like it's it's the about, law, but it's more. It isn't, yeah, it isn't just the do's and don'ts. And I think uh, growing up, that's what I understood the law to be: is the things I shouldn't do, or I'll get punished, and the things I should do, and then I'll get rewarded. Uh, but I like your word relationship. Um, it was pointed out to me at some point in my faith journey that uh, those first three commandments of the 10 have to do with our relationship with God and the other seven, however you number them, have to do with our relationship with one another. So it is very much not about something that we do or don't do. It's about how we live our lives in terms of faith as a faith community, both in relationship to God and to one another. I, I think um, that that's very good. Thanks for um, helping us out with that. And I, and I think when we think about the pre-wilderness people of God, um, when we think about uh, the, quote, Israelites who were in Egypt, um, we, we think that they were more of a formed and cohesive people than they were. Um, when Moses... Um, when God, through Moses, released the people from slavery, um, the, the people who came out of Egypt, uh, some of them 
you know, had Hebrew heritage. A good many of them did not. Even those who were Hebrew, I mean, they'd been slaves. They'd been so long, you know, working themselves to the bone. They weren't given a day off to, you know, to worship, which is what, you know, Moses said, let my people, you know, go to worship their Lord. Um, so when they entered into the wilderness, um, they were just a loose rabble of folk. Um, some of the common heritage, some not. They were just a bunch of slaves who had been um, released. So how was it that God then in the wilderness at that time used the law to gather that loose rabble into a people? Mm. Yeah, you know, I think so when what I'd like to think about is is like when a baby is born into a, a family, right? Uh, the first message that they get or should in a in a well functioning family is is that they belong, right? Like they they belong to mom and dad, whatever that might look like, right to brother or sister, whatever that might look like. The first message that they get is they belong um, and that they are cared for. I see God having done that right through the stories of Genesis, uh, showing God's faithfulness again and again that you belong to me, right? And then uh, after that, what they start to learn is uh, how to behave in ways that work in that family so that they can be integrated well into that family. Sometimes that's taught overtly, right? Like sometimes it's taught clearly, like, you know, mom or dad might say, do this or don't do that, right? Or you have a schedule to your day. It gives form um, and substance to your day. Um, sometimes it's taught implicitly, right? Like those of us who are parents know that kids are always watching us. Um, or those of us that work with kids know that kids are always watching us and we communicate a lot about what is and isn't acceptable behavior by what we uh, what we do. This is kind of this is Israel growing up in a family, right? This is Israel growing up in God's family. Uh, they've gotten the message that they belong and that God cares about them enough to set them free. And now they need that sort of uh, shaping time, right? Defining that relationship. What does it look like? to to live in relationship and so for the for the israelites in the wilderness the law is really a gift um because it gives shape to an otherwise sort of amorphous uh mysterious vague life that they don't know really what to do with so having all the those 10 laws been given to them uh everything worked out just fine as long as everyone behaved themselves and did what they were supposed to do according to the law. I like what you're suggesting though, Steve, is that it was common ground. Everyone knew what was uh, uh, given to them uh, by their Lord. Uh, but then trying to live that law, uh, they found out that can be very, very difficult. And uh, so as long as there was order, uh, you know, it worked out. And when all, all of a sudden there was some disorder, uh, the wheels came off. And so the law didn't necessarily hold them together. They needed something more than that. And that's a great setup um, for uh, another question that I have that the something more than that, of course, you're talking about the need of um, not just being told what to do or being convinced what we should do, but our need for a savior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and in Lutheran theology, we talk about the law in two ways. Um, we talk about the, the two uses of the law. Um, one, that, that the law um, properly observed allows us to live together in community. Um, and two, that the law convicts us of our sin um, and shows us the need of a savior. Mm -hmm. um, that even as we try to follow the law, we're made aware that we're not so good at it, which really is how we ended up with another 603 laws, um, you know, that each law was kind of added to the first 10 to try and, you know, stick a finger in the dike, um, yeah, yeah. plug a loophole. Um, so my question is, when looking at these two uses of the law, um, convicting us of our sin and allowing us to live together. Um, do you see anything in those two areas in 
how we've struggled during our pandemic time. Mm. Craig, what do you think? I'll let you go first on this one. Well, I mean, just the obvious to me is um, thou shalt not kill. Mm. And look what's happened just in the last couple of weeks here. Um, we are we, we were hoping that the law would kind of hold everything in check and that people would love one another and not do harm to one another. Uh, but what is revealed is this this evil that is within each of us uh, comes out in some of the most heinous kind of ways. And we've just seen some of the great sadness here in the last couple of weeks. And um, so for me, that that use of the law is just a revealing to me that we need something more than anything that we can legislate or come up with on our own. We need a savior uh, who will not only forgive, uh, but redeem us as well. And even those who are the worst perpetrators among us. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, and I also, so I think there's that, so you mentioned the two uses of the law that there's, there's the, um, the, the, the conviction of sin, right? That when we know the law, like you shall not kill and we see it still happening, that convicts us, right? It, 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 it opens our hearts to realize that we are in need of a savior. And I think that that has certainly been revealed in and through this year of pandemic, right? It's shown the depth of human sin, it's also shown us the need for that civil law, right? For learning how to live with each other. Um, one, one of the characteristics of this pandemic that I've been experiencing is just uh, a sort of loss of shape to my life, right? Uh, like it's not the same routine that I developed over eight years at Our Saviors. Uh, it's not the same routine that I've developed living in my home for five years. It's not, I just, the routine is completely gone. And so needing some sort of like form and function, uh, form in which to function, right? Like I, I need some structure to, to my life in order to be able to thrive in my relationships with other people, right? Because I, I mean, the temptation for me throughout this pandemic in a more, uh, I'll say a less serious way than what you're talking about, Greg, uh, my life a lot of times has been, uh, I've been tempted to sort of just like disengage uh to just watch netflix and not really do anything else right or attempted to just kind of like you know uh ignore everybody else's problems and focus on myself and so i i need that sort of like um push from the outside that tells me that life is meant to be more than this right i think for me too uh we've seen in the pandemic there have been people uh with very scientific kind of backgrounds that have done a lot of homework and have handed down to us uh, what they consider to be the best ways that we can live safely together. And uh, so I was just playing around with, with names the other day and just kind of joking with myself and saying, you know, that comes from Dr. Fauci, but I found that within my own pandemic world, I'm Dr. Grouchy. And <laughs> I, I sometimes just rebel against those hand-me-down kind of people that are trying to tell me how to live my life and I fight against it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about pandemic, it's about things that uh, come down from other sources of authority. And that old Adam within me says, "Uh, -uh I'm doing it my way, you can't tell me what to do. And, and that shows up time and again in the Old Testament with God's people and in the New Testament, even with Jesus. You can't tell me what to do, I'm going to do it my way. And then you pay the consequence. And fortunately, mm -hmm. there is grace that abounds when we you know, as someone has said, uh, we can't even organize a two car parade without messing it up. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and consequences are are such a big thing that, you know, when especially when we look at the Ten Commandments, well, you know, as long as I don't kill someone, um, as long as I don't, you know, step out of my wife or lie about my neighbor, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. But what we've seen in this pandemic is that living together in community um, is about the very small things too. Um, mm -hmm. It's about trying very hard to see that I'm careful so that um, I don't end up with the coronavirus and, and infect someone. Um, working to, to see that when I do go someplace that I have to do and I have to make decisions about what have to means differently than you know before the pandemic hit because before I could just go anywhere at any time and do anything, but now I have to be choosy because I'm responsible for the health of my neighbor. Mm. Um, and when I do go to those places, I have to remember to 
to take my mask and pull it up over my nose because <laughs> I'm responsible for my neighbor. And, yeah. and it, there's this whole, you know, responsible for neighbor thing and living in community that the first use of the law, um, you know, as Lutherans, sometimes we poo poo it, but the first use of the law is real and necessary. Um, that, you know, God reminds us here are the things you do to successfully live with one another. Um, yeah. And ab absolutely, we fail and we need a, a savior for forgiveness and for rebirth. And we also need to remember that, you know, we there are some things that we um, can succeed in doing to help and protect our neighbor. Yeah, growing up, I thought uh, the commandments were something I could do, that they were doable. <laughs> and uh, at some point along the way, I kind of figured out, you know, they aren't doable. It isn't, it isn't that I'm supposed to keep track of. So I wake up every day and say, you know what, I'm going to work on the fourth commandment today, or I'm going to work on the sixth commandment a little more today and see if I can't get that bugger down. Hmm. Uh, I've, I've come to the point where it reveals the sin, the old stuff in us that keep leaking out. And, uh, but fortunately, law and gospel go together like, you know, hand and glove. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I, I, I appreciate, Steve, that you bring up the idea that, like, the law is also a matter of caring for your neighbor, right? Like, I, I think of any relationship that a person is in, we need boundaries, right? We need limits on that relationship, right? If I don't have um, particular boundaries with uh, someone I, I love deeply, I open myself up to abuse, and I open myself up to abusing them as well. Um, boundaries are a really important part of our relationships, and the law provides us with some boundaries mm. with each other, right? It gives us it gives us some structure to the way that we relate to each other, so that I can't just use another person, and I can't allow myself just to be used either. And I, I want to. We need to wrap this up here. I want to conclude by pointing out that the purpose of the law never was and is not still for anyone to be pure. Um, the purpose of the law is not for me to be righteous. The purpose of the law is for you to live well. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we, we get it wrong. When we think that we do what we can to follow the Ten Commandments so that we can say we follow the Ten Commandments. Um, we do what we can to follow the Ten Commandments um, so that we can see that in doing so, we have helped our neighbor to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Jesus certainly in his lifetime modeled that for us. Yeah. Um, and, and because we can't model it as well and completely as he did, um, you know, he's there for us in forgiveness and resurrection. Mm -hmm. You remind me of that beautiful verse of scripture. He didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill the law, which only reminds me again that I can't, but I know who can. Yep. Amen. I think that's that's a great place for the conversation to end. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, now we turn to our time of prayer, and I'm going to invite Alex Haas to uh, lead us. At the end of each petition that Alex leads, um, he will say, hear us, O God, and we can say, your mercy is great. I'll be saying that too. Mm -hmm. Great. Trusting in our generous God, let us pray. Bless your church, O oh God, so that as children of light, we may shine, shine brightly in a word that longs to know you. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Mercy is great. Restore the green pastures and the still waters of this earth and lead us to be responsible caretakers of all that you have created. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. Is great. Break the barriers of hatred and prejudice between those of different races, faiths, genders, age, and ability. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, great. is great. Bring goodness and mercy to all those who suffer. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, great. is great. Be present in the in this community and open up our eyes so that we look not on outward appearances, but upon one another's hearts. 
Your mercy is great. Into your hands we entrust all for whom we pray, believing in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, to our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Alex. And we close with a song uh, led by uh, Stacy. So you can unmute and I will share my screen.
Thank you very much, Stacy. I appreciate it. <clears throat> a couple of quick announcements as we head out on our way. First, Holy Week is next week. It begins with Palm Sunday. There are uh, full palm fronds, like the one uh, you can kind of see it back behind me, behind uh, on the wall there. Uh, there are palm fronds available for pickup on the bench uh, by the peace pole outside of uh, the church. You can pick those up for you and your family members. There are also, for uh, the whole of Holy Week, there are Holy Week kits. And these are available in our um, in the narthex here. And within it, you'll find a devotional book that will uh, provide you with some uh, thoughts and things that you can do uh, alone or with family members. Um, and there are also instructions for our Seder meal during Maundy Thursday services and uh, instructions also for uh, some activities that you can do around Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Um, I'm not a crafty person, but uh, I can do these crafts and I figure if Pastor Tim can do it, so can you. All right. So we have nails so that you can make yourself a, uh, a nail cross at home. We also have materials, uh, so for on Easter Sunday, you can uh, turn this bag into an empty tomb. We're really hoping to get people to do that and send in their pictures of their empty tombs so that we can have them uh, on display throughout the season of Easter, uh, each of us contributing uh, more and more to uh, our life together here. Uh, Steve, any other announcements having to do with Holy Week or anything else? No, just encourage people to check out Facebook with all of the details um, and read the emails and the posts that have come out to you uh, that include the same. Yeah, it is the season. It's church o'clock around here. So uh, there is a lot that will be coming at you uh, in the coming week here. So Alex, you can close us out. Go in peace. God is with you. Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We have a closing prelude now. Oh. Postlude. Postlude. Thank you. It's going to be as long as the one before. <laughs> There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail.
Thank you so much, Stacy, and thank you to all of our leaders tonight. Uh, we will see you a lot over uh, the next week. Bye now. Bye. Good to see you all. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. Thanks, Stacy. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Later. Thanks, Alex.